Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and a great honor to celebrate 350 years of wonderful education and research here in Lund. And uh, I would like to tell you about some of my uh, recent research, uh, trying to ask a question which I think is one of the central questions, at least in human uh, cognitive neuroscience, study of the human brain. And the question is the issue of the singularity of the human brain. What is special, what is singular about the brain of our species such that this brain is able to develop high-level representations in the domain of language, but also understanding of the outside world, science, mathematics. And um, I'm going to show that we begin to make progress in understanding the sort of brain networks that may be special in the human brain and why. Um, it starts, the evidence starts in caves in the south of France. I don't know if you've visited some of these caves like Lascaux. It's absolutely amazing to see these paintings. But it's not just paintings, it's also symbols, such as the hand here, or more abstract symbols. We don't know what they mean, but they are abstract representations. And um, this sort of evidence is interpreted as uh, undoubtful evidence that uh, these people must have had language because they were presenting symbols, but also because in order to get to caves as a group, uh, they had to hold a whole cultural system and presumably speak about it before getting in there. But how do we know? Language does not fossilize. And the remains that we have are not completely unambiguous. Uh, these sorts of artifacts are interpreted as evidence for language. Um, but they are, in fact, evidence for music or mathematics. For instance, this beautiful piece of ochre from uh, 70,000 years ago in South Africa. You can see these parallel lines and a uh, sort of network of hexagons and triangles already 70,000 years ago. So this is a clear sign of some kind of geometrical understanding. Numbers are evident in very old artifacts, tally marks, and also music uh, in the form of these flutes. So it's very clear that Homo sapiens must have had all of these languages of speech, mathematics, music already uh, for a very long time. But what I found very interesting is that in the case of mathematics, it seems to be even older. So we have evidence such as this. I agree, it's slim evidence, but this is a shell uh, attributed to Homo erectus in which there is an engraving of a sort of zigzag shape. Now, zigzag looks trivial, but there is no chimpanzee who ever drew a zigzag. It's parallel lines alternating. Um, and, of course, everybody knows that ancient humans were making bifaces. They're called bifaces because they have two perpendicular orthogonal planes of symmetry. Uh, one symmetry around this axis, for instance, and one across the, the stone here, for instance. Okay. And um, they are clearly they have properties of geometry, such as having lines and circles that go beyond the usefulness for the function of these as tools. There is a certain sense of beauty associated with this, and it's uh, clearest in the case of this particular artifact where uh, people endeavored to make this uh, fossilized shell the center of the piece here. So it's a very clear sense of symmetry, beauty, and these productions are extraordinarily old. They date all the way to 1.6 million years ago, so way before modern humans, probably Homo ergaster, Archaic erectus. And I was uh, amazed to see there are even older artifacts that uh, are called uh, in the literature polyhedras or spheroids. Some of them are almost perfect spheres that must have taken hundreds of hours of work in order to create. They are not clearly very useful. They're called bolas sometimes, but if this weights uh, more than one kilo, it's not very useful to throw. Uh, maybe they were playing some kind of game or something, but uh, the, we don't know. But we can only marvel at the fact that they had the concept of a sphere and they tried to dig it out of of stone. So um, the question is, could it be that mathematical intuitions evolved independently of language, maybe prior to language, maybe prior to Homo sapiens, and more generally, how are math and language related? Does the evidence for math necessarily uh, create evidence for language? I think the answer is no. Um, so uh, people have discussed what is the language of mathematics, what we do when we do mathematics. And uh, Galileo has written this very famous sentence, says, you know, we need a language. Mathematics is a language. The book of the the universe is written in the mathematical language, and the symbols are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures, without whose help it is impossible to comprehend a single word of it. And it's true, there is all of the evidence that mathematics involves language of symbols, language of figures. 
But uh, is it related to natural language? Here there is divergence of opinions. Um, someone very famous in the domain of linguistics, Noam Chomsky, thinks that it all boils down to uh, the organization of the language system. The origins of the mathematical capacity lies in an abstraction from linguistic operations. So we first got the language capacity, according to Chomsky, and then we develop all of these other th uh, things, mathematics, uh, music, and so on. Well, actually, many scientists would disagree. And if you ask physicists or mathematicians, they will say, no, I don't do language when I do my science. And this was stated very clearly by Albert Einstein. Einstein was responding to Hadamard, a famous French mathematician, who was making an inquiry amongst mathematicians and physicists. And Einstein wrote in his letter, words and language, whether written or spoken, do not seem to play any part in my thought processes. The psychological entities that serve as building blocks for my thought are certain signs or images, more or less clear, that I can reproduce and recombine at will. Very similar to Galileo. And I think many scientists would tell you the same. I first know it outside of words. I have intuitions about it. I think I know the mathematical truth. And then I have to go very slowly to the words. And writing the paper is another process, but different from the original thinking. So who is right? We can't rely on intuition. Uh, just introspection from Einstein, even if it comes from Einstein, is not sufficient. We need science. And uh, can we decide between Chomsky and Einstein? You know, this, is, this looks like a very daring enterprise. Um, but uh, I'm going to take sides, and I wrote this book called The Number Sense, in which I claim, more like Einstein, that uh, the brain was endowed, actually, with non-verbal representations of a mathematical nature, of proto-mathematical nature. So we have representations of space, of time. We heard about space this morning uh, from Edward Moser, very long evolutionary story, nothing to do with language. So we share this representation of space, time, and number with other species, and the claim is that this is the foundation for our mathematics. We formalize this intuition, so you're using a hierarchy of symbols, but these symbols remain attached to the underlying nonverbal so-called core semantic systems. So can we test this idea uh, using brain imaging? That's what I'm trying to do at the moment. So first of all, we begin to know a lot more about the system of language in the human brain. At least we begin to localize it very consistently, and I, this was also very clear in Bob Knight's lecture. Um, so uh, here are several experiments that all converge on the same circuit. So suppose you present to subjects in the MRI scanner a list of words. There is no way you can make sense of it. The words don't fit together. You get very low activation. As you increase the groupings of words that can go together, two words, three words, four words, all the way to a full sentence of 12 words, you get monotonically increasing activation in all of this system in the left hemisphere along the superior temporal sulcus and inferior frontal gyrus, so-called Broca's area. And the, the areas in red are the core of this syntax system because they will continue to respond even if you use pseudo words, so-called jabberwocky. So you say, the groovy shook of my uh, bullock is, and so on and so forth. Something meaningless but syntactically correct will activate the areas in red. So they seem to operate as a syntactic system. There's a lot of converging evidence for that. And uh, I'm just citing some recent evidence. Suppose I, I ask you to manipulate trees in your mind. So I give you a sentence like the kids who exhausted their parents fell asleep. Who fell asleep? Kids or the parents? That's the kids, right? Well, notice that you heard their parents fell asleep. They were in a sequence together. This is something that Chomsky has been playing all along, that the sequence is not enough. It's the tree structure that counts. And um, in order to answer these sort of questions, you have to manipulate the trees in your mind. When you do so, exactly this network activates that this posterior superior temporal sulcus component and this large component in the inferior frontal gyrus. Um, we find the same sort of network in experiment after experiment from many labs, many languages, in including sign language, very interestingly. Sign language is a real language for the deaf. And uh, in patients who have aphasia, uh, the lesions tend to cluster in these uh, same spots. Okay many other experiments. Uh, just to show you one more experiment, we've been starting in the lab to also use intracranial recordings, this incredibility to have access directly to the human brain in these epilepsy patients. And we ask, you know, uh, can we see 
with the proper timing, the evidence for syntactic structures that the linguists have been claiming. So the claim is that there are three structures in the brain. And so we presented to subject little sentences uh, generated by a computer. So they are sometimes a little bit silly, like Bill Gates met two very tired dancers in Dallas. One word after the other on the screen. And what we found was that there are electrodes that track the structure of the sentence. So each line is a trial. Here you can see three word structures, four words, five words, all the way to ten word sentences. You can see, first of all, that the activity, which is shown in color here, nicely tracks the structure of the sentence all the way to the end. At the end, there's some event happening, which depends on the complexity of the sentence. But even inside the sentence, you find that there are moments when there is increasing activity, you see it in red, and then sudden drops. And the black marks mark the boundaries of the tree structures of the sentence. So what is summarized here is you have activation which is monotonous as a function of how many words are waiting to be put together as a little tree structure of language. And then there is a collapse of activation suddenly when you can put them together to form what we call in linguistics a constituent, a small tree structure that itself will be later integrated into a larger sentence. So there are many electrodes that show this effect. They're shown in red on this slide here. And you can see that they map out the language system that we found in fMRI. There are a few more dorsal areas, but by and large, it's the superior temporal sulcus and surrounding electrodes here. So slightly more uh, below the area that Bob Knight was talking about, which is about speech phonemes themselves, but now we're talking about higher level structures of language and into Broca's area. So just to say that the language system is well mapped, and um, since we begin to very reproducibly find it, we can just take any of you in this room and put you in an fMRI scanner, and in five minutes, we localize these brain areas for language processing. Uh, now we can ask, you know, do mathematicians use these language areas when they are doing mathematics? So this was a fun study that we published last year. We decided that eventually we would scan professional mathematicians and uh, see what's happening in there. Um, there are some issues with controls. And in the paper, we write very formally that we compared with professors of humanities of matched academic standing. Now, whether this is true or not, I'll let you uh, Yes, I, we, we did our best. They're at the same level in the university, but without mathematical training. So what did we do? Well, we had them lie in the scanner, and we asked uh, them to listen to mathematical statements and try to guess whether it's true or false. So I don't know if there are mathematicians or budding mathematicians in the audience. Surely there are. And so uh, see if you can guess whether this is true, false, or in some cases, it's just meaningless. I hope the sound will work. Do we have sound? There is no non-vanishing continuous tangent vector field on even dimensional spheres. True or false? Ah, it's true. <laughs> Not obvious, huh? You have to be a professional mathematician. This has to do with painting a sphere or, or combing a sphere. It's a famous theorem. Um, here's another one. Any square matrix is equivalent to a permutation matrix. True or false? False, thank you. That's pretty trivial, actually, if you know your mathematics. Good. <laughs> Let's hear another one. The trace of a unit ball diverges in any dimension different from one and infinity. True or false? It's complete gibberish. This is not mathematics. This is just words strung together. But for a mathematician, it's like, oh, this is weird. This is nothing. OK, so this is not going to activate the mass networks because it's, it's very low level. Uh, you can immediately reject it as being meaningless. Uh, finally, we had control sentences such as this one. In ancient Greece, a citizen who couldn't pay his debt was made a slave. True or false? It's not so easy. You have to gather your knowledge of ancient Greece, slavery. Could it be true? So in all of these domains, we ask for plausibility. You don't have time to make a theorem in mathematics, but you have to judge whether it's likely to be true or not. But it's not in mathematics. We also had calculation uh, as uh, to localize the calculation areas. And we also use this so-called localizer for categories such as bodies, tools, faces, houses, but also words, numbers, equations, and checkerboards, just to map out the visual system and its category specificity for these different objects. 
So what do we find? Well, the remarkable finding was that we found that for any mathematical statement, you have a very particular activation that you don't get for the control sentences. So you can see it here, whether it's statements in analysis or algebra or topology or geometry, you see these areas kicking out at the end of the statement when you have understood the sentence, they kick out, and uh, they are the bilateral parietal areas, bilateral inferotemporal areas, and also dorsal uh, prefrontal cortex, a very large extent extending downwards into the inferior frontal gyrus, but from the dorsal part here. So very reproducible network. Every mathematician showed it, and you just don't see it. It's just not activated at all for these control sentences, even though subjects are thinking, and you know they're just equally hard, um, but uh, they are not activated. Um, this is just specific to mathematicians, so if you're not a mathematician, you're listening to these sentences like you just did, um, you know, you get just a flat line. You don't get this differentiation into math and non-math. So it creates an interaction. This is particular to the mathematician, mathematician's brain for these sentences. Um, you also get the converse network, so I've shown it in green here. So there are areas of the brain that are involved in thinking about the semantics of sentences, like the slaves in Greece, you know? You are thinking hard, and you get this bilateral network of areas in uh, so-called angular gyrus, or temporal parietal junction, anterior temporal lobe, and very mesial anterior prefrontal cortex, they all kick up just for these sentences outside of mathematics and regardless of the particular content. So it's sort of a double dissociation, very clear. Mathematics is different. And what about language areas, strictly speaking? Well, these are already well-known language areas in the left hemisphere and they are not active for mathematics. But uh, we can simply ask, you know, what about all of these areas that we, we showed before were involved in syntax and semantics of, of language? Um, they simply do not respond differentially. They're activated very briefly during the statement, so you can see, and then they fall down, and the activation is then transferred to these other semantic areas. If anything, some of them show a little bit more activation, but not to mathematics, but to the other statements, the non-mathematical statements. So we can see that language and math call on very distinct brain areas. Uh, in fact, they're almost complementary to each other. In red, you have the language system, and in yellow, you have the mathematics system, and they're almost like interdigitate, but they don't touch each other. And in single subjects, we can see they come very close, but uh, they, don't, they don't overlap. So I think we get a clean answer. Math has its own special networks, not language, but what is it? In fact, uh, the network that we've just shown, uh, we knew for a very long time. It's not unique to the mathematician. You don't have to be a mathematician to have this network. All of you activate this network whenever you do calculation, whenever you think of a number. You think of number three, you get these activations. In the parietal lobe, we've known that for a very long time, and more recently, uh, Joseph Parvisi and his collaborator discovered there are these bilateral ventral temporal areas that we now find very easily in fMRI that are also activated just by numbers. Here you see in our subjects, very high level math, just numbers, calculation activates exactly the same sort of areas. And in single subjects, not just overlap, but it's really the same exact actual voxels, representational similarity. So um, mathematicians seem to build upon something that we all have. We all have a sense of number. We all know about numbers. But mathematicians build upon that, and they enhance this network. And we saw that very clearly when we look at the ventral part of the visual cortex. So again, this is something you may not know. So if you look at the visual cortex here, you see that there are lots of specialization. Well, uh, Colin spoke about the specialization for faces versus places, houses here. You can see this face area and this area that responds more to places. And houses, but there is much more specialization for words, for instance, and we also found specialization for numbers and formulas, and even the non-mathematicians have them to some extent. They are not completely deprived, of course, they have higher education, so they had some mathematics, but the mathematicians have enlarged areas that respond to formulas and to numbers. The fact that you've been trained as a mathematician to process expressions in mathematics and also numbers has made you these areas grow in size and in intensity of activation, and so we can detect that in the mathematician's brain. Um, now, there is something interesting. Uh, you may ask, you know, as you learn these new things, you learn to be a mathematician or you learn to read, are there also areas that suffer in the brain? Are there activations that diminish 
as you learn something. And we found one that was smaller in the mathematician's brain, the only one, and this is faces. And I see some of you laughing. I was very flabbergasted. I was trained as a mathematician, you know? And so the only activation in the brain that's smaller in mathematicians compared to our control subjects is the face system. It has reduced activation in the right hemisphere. So I don't know what this means. We have no behavioral correlate, um, but it's interesting that the face system seems to be competing with these other cultural acquisitions. In previous work, we found that when you learn to read, your face system is reorganized. Because you learn to read, you develop this visual word form area in the left hemisphere here. And as it grows, the face system is being pushed in the right hemisphere. And now we find that when you're a mathematician, you have bilateral growth of this number and formula system, and it seems that the right hemispheric phase system is shrinking a little bit, even in the right hemisphere. So it's moving around and shrinking a little bit. We don't know, again, if this has functional consequences, but it's very, very intriguing. There are people who study prosopagnosia, the inability to recognize faces, and there is a case of developmental prosopagnosia, people who cannot recognize faces even when they are young, so they don't have a brain lesion, but they have a developmental problem. And I'm told that it's very easy to recruit such people at MIT, for instance, or in other universities. So uh, it's a possibility that there is a sort of relation here. Well, I, wa I won't talk anymore about faces, but just to show you that being a mathematician, you have enhanced areas that already exist in all of us. It's not something completely special, but you refine the representation in these same systems that were used before for numbers. And um, we've replicated this now many, many times, not just that you have to think about something very hard. It's really mathematics. So suppose I make you think about something simple. Like we all know, I hope it's the case in this room, we all know that a squared minus b squared is a minus b times a plus b. We know it, know it by rote. We can recite it. It doesn't feel like mathematics anymore. But when you present such facts, you still get the same network in blue here to subject, even rote facts. Uh, we can even present extremely simple statements. X is a Y. The sine function is periodical. The penguin is a bird, okay? When you present this sort of statement, just the mass statements will activate the areas in blue. When you do this, you lose the prefrontal cortex activation, you see, because it's so simple, you can respond immediately. But you still get these two posterior, parietal, and inferior temporal areas that therefore have to do really with the concepts of mathematics, even when they are so simple, you know, everybody knows the sine function is periodical, or let's say two is an even number. But this is still the concepts of mathematics, you will activate this network. So, um, where do these networks come from? Do we just have to grow them from experience, you know, in a world which is structured? We grow as scientists, we experience the world and so on. Or could it be that they are more abstract? Um, is visual experience really needed? Well, I was stunned to learn uh, the first time that there are actually mathematicians who are blind. In fact, this is a very, very famous uh, case of Nicholas Sanderson, who was blind in the first year of life. And um, he uh, holds the chair of Newton in uh, Cambridge, you know, a remarkable mathematician of his time, was discussed by Diderot in the Letter to the Blind, very famous text. Um, well, uh, do they acquire mathematics in a completely different way, or are they just the normal mathematician? So we were very lucky to find three blind mathematicians and to scan them. And the answer is very clear. Blind mathematicians use the same areas as normal subjects. They have the same sort of network in the same localization. It's not that because you're blind, you've had to develop a completely different system. This system is old and stable. And the only thing that we found in mathematician is something that actually uh, famous mathematician Cédric Villani predicted to me. Uh, he said, you know, uh, there is this mathematician, he's blind, uh, he's great, you know, really, you should, you should scan him, he's a top-level mathematician. But, you know, it's too easy for him because he has more cortex to dedicate to mathematics. <laughs> well, I thought it was a joke, but Cédric Villani was right. Uh, this is occipital cortex, and it's in a blind subject, so it's no longer used for vision. It gets reused for mathematics, so there is additional cortex being recruited into the mathematics network. But um, they use, by and large, similar areas as sighted mathematicians with the addition of these occipital areas. These areas develop outside of visual experience, and they are dissociable between language and math. So this is the mass network that we found. There's a lot of evidence now for this. So there is intracranial recordings evidence from Joseph Parvizi's lab. Uh, all of these electrodes here in uh, 
uh, blue or purple, um, activate when you do simple calculations, like 13 plus 5 equals 17, is it true or false? Whereas the areas in red activate when you read a little sentence and think about its meaning. Um, it's so striking that uh, it can even dissociate when you have a brain lesion. So um, suppose you have a brain lesion like uh, Professor Knight showed us and you develop aphasia. You cannot speak anymore. Well, some of these people can still do mathematics. They may still be able to calculate. It's actually quite frequent in Alzheimer's disease in the first stages that calculation remains preserved. And uh, they may still be able to do algebra if they learn to do algebra. So they may still do A plus B cube is equal to A cube plus 3 A square B plus 3 B square A plus uh, A plus B cube, sorry, uh, without uh, being able to uh, speak uh, normal languages. Um, so this is a remarkable dissociation. And we found this dissociation in many other uh, ways. Uh, for instance, we've gone to study in the Amazon. People who are called the Munduruku. They are very interesting because they have language, of course, they have their own language, but the language doesn't have many terms for mathematics, including numbers. Their numbers stop at five. And after five, there are words for few and many. And even with the word for five means five-ish. It's not really five, it's anything between, let's say, three and ten. So these people have a very rudimentary sense of uh, number, but they have intuitions of mathematics. And we could show that they have intuitions of large numbers, intuitions of geometry, in the absence of words to say it. And um, I'll uh, end by saying that uh, there are even arithmetic intuitions in infants and in monkeys. Um, this has been shown that uh, if you present them in concrete form, you present them sets of objects and their combinations, uh, even uh, young infants and even monkeys will represent the corresponding number. So the sense of number at least is very, very old. And in the monkey, this has been mapped all the way down to neurons that like to respond to a particular quantity, a particular number. So you'll find neurons that prefer three objects, fire very strongly to three objects, but not to two, not to five. And remarkably, these neurons are uh, very frequent in the intraparietal sulcus at a location which is very similar to the one we find in our subjects. So, um, I just finished by saying where we are going with this research. It's quite fine to study mathematicians, but it's very difficult to understand how the information is being represented. So we try to simplify in a way that ultimately we could do exactly the same experiments in humans, including young uh, children or babies, but also in the monkeys, and try to compare and see whether there is really something very special about the human brain in terms of language, of mathematics. So we've simplified the task, and now instead of studying professional mathematics and matrices and so on, we're studying extremely simple things that are, we think are still a little bit mathematics. So let me just test you for one second with this we used in preschoolers. We're going to play a little movie, and um, the task is the following for a preschooler. We say, well, there is a little fish. He likes to hide in these uh, different ponds. And um, he likes to hide in different places. So can you predict where he's going to go next? You know, where is he going to go? OK, where is he going to go? Do you know? Do you say here and here and here? Yes, you're right. That's exactly what he's going to do. What did you do here? Well, you picked on the regularity. It's actually the zigzag pattern I showed you on the shell before, right? That zigzag's pretty abstract because, first of all, you've not seen the whole sequence. You're extrapolating something you've never seen. It's not even learning. It's generalization, right? And you've learned something abstract, which is there are parallel lines, and they are going to continue. So we've been studying exactly this with various sorts of uh, structures, and we found that we can only account for the data by postulating that you have a sort of inner language, but a language of space, a language of geometry. You require primitives such as symmetries with respect to vertical or horizontal, and unique things like the ability to repeat and nest the repeat. So, for instance, this zigzag structure is actually a nesting of horizontal movement, and you change the starting point. Okay, so this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And in order to account for, let's say, two nested rectangles, which people can learn, you have to account for three levels of nesting. So it's a sort of programming language. The claim is that we have a sort of programming language in our heads, and the behavior of people, how accurate they are in predicting the rest of the sequence, is dependent on the complexity 
in this language. What is called Kolmogorov complexity is a technical term just to mean the length of the program. How long is the formula? How complex is the formula that you must have in your mind in order to capture uh, that spatial sequence? So we've been scanning subjects with this. I think I'm out of time. But I just want to say that when we scan subjects, the complexity of the sequence, well, all, they are, all they have to do, by the way, is follow with their eyes in the case of the scanning. We just flash these sequences, the little fish, and we tell them, you know, just follow with your eyes, except that when you understand, you actually don't follow anymore, you anticipate. Your eyes move in advance of the target. And that is a sure sign that you've integrated the structure. So you use that as a sort of implicit measure that you've understood the sequence. And when we do that, we find that the brain areas that uh, activate in response to this sequence in proportion to complexity are the very similar areas that we found for mathematics in our more complex tasks. And they include uh, this inferior frontal gyrus going you know, down into Broca's area, but actually just dorsal to the activations for language processing, such that if we compare directly the language network and this new mathematical network, the two come close, but they don't overlap once again. So I think I come to my conclusion. It's time to stop. Um, first of all, very clearly, mathematics is a language, and even geometry, very simple geometrical understanding, requires a language, but that language does not appeal to classical language areas. So Einstein was right. I'm not doing language, but I'm doing mathematics, at least initially. I can put it into words, I can hear a sentence of mathematics, but I convert this into an inner language, which is not natural language. Mathematics builds upon ancient non-linguistic foundations, what we call core knowledge of number, quantity, space, time, shared with many other species. And it can emerge in the absence of any visual experience. We think in the absence of any experience at all. It's present in young babies. It's present in newborns already. Um, we think still that humans are special because we recombine these concepts in novel ways. So two hypotheses that we want to pursue in the future. First of all, that humans are special in discretizing these concepts using symbols. So we have concepts of exact number. Only humans can think of exactly number 11 and different from 12 or 13. No other animals don't do this. And second, combining these concepts into a language of thought. Um, now, what's very clear is that there are many languages of the brain, many languages of thought. It's not one circuit that has changed, and this raises fundamental questions for evolution. We need to think of some kind of event that has created the ability to create multiple languages in multiple areas, including Broca's areas, but not one circuit, several parallel circuits. And that will be the research for the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dunn. Um, do we have any questions? Any hands in the air? While you think about this, oh, I, we have a question. Just a second. We'll get uh -huh. the beautiful catch box. OK, I'll do as good as I can, but you'll probably need to help me. And then put your hands in the air so they can see where to throw. Perfect. There you okay. go. Yeah? Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would ask, um, when small children age three or four started to explicitly uh, do some kind of math, proto-math, um, would it affect them whether they do it in their first language or the second? Ah, very interesting. Uh, so, um, we've studied this actually in the past, and I think this requires more study now. But the evidence suggests that it depends a little bit on how you learn and what you learn. Um, for the really interesting deep intuitions of mathematics, it does not matter. You learn it in one language, you generalize to the other. But for some facts, such as multiplication facts, for instance, the things that you learn as rote words, basically, 3 times 9 is 27, then it does matter. So we found that there is this dissociation. There are, there are some mathematical facts that are learned verbally and don't generalize easily to the other language. And so indeed, uh, so I know many friends who are bilingual. One of them is Italian, but he works in Harvard for, I think, probably 40 years now, he still goes back to Italian when he does you know, mental calculation. Uh, that's probably because the, some of the uh, rote facts do depend on language, but that's a small proportion of the real mathematical knowledge that we know. The boundary, however, remains to be finely studied. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thanks. 
Over there. Yeah, hey, so um, I have a question about this um, additional mathematical capacities that builds um, on uh, numerical cognition, right? Because this is what you said, that we have this basic uh, numerical cognition capacities that is shared with animals and then very small children can do that already and people who didn't develop the language can do that already. And after mathematicians, through training, through language impact, they built those um, right. more sophisticated representations. And after you show those experiments that you've done on geometry with Amalric, right? And so I was wondering, um, so I, I can see many mathematical, you know, aspects of mathematics when you need discrete structures and natural numbers and then you build upon. But when I think about analysis or geometry, this is not the first thing I will think about. Those are not natural numbers. So would you say that we have many different core cognitive systems that are there and mathematicians build upon or it will really come from numbers and something else? Right, you uh, see, thank you. you. It's a great question, a great occasion to clarify. I don't think number is the only foundation. I think number is one of the foundations and uh, the others are a representation of space and time. But they seem to be intertwined together in the same sort of brain areas in the parietal cortex. And by the way, this network that I'm showing for mathematics, a very large and extended network, is covering several brain areas that probably have their own specialization. But even inside the parietal cortex where, uh, uh, for instance, Ben Harvey has been finding a little map of number in a rather precise site, on top of it there is also a map of the sizes of objects. Mm -hmm. So size and number are overlapping and using the same sort of uh, circuitry or maybe intermingled columns. If we can zoom in like uh, Bob Knight was doing, we might see that there are intermingled columns. So number and space are very tightly uh, uh, mixed. And in fact, they need to be mixed in this language of geometry that I was describing. You need to be able to say, I'm going to do this twice or three times. It's completely uh, intermingled. So I think it's this language of mathematics that allows you to combine these, con these concepts together to create higher level structures. And in math, the mapping from number to language is absolutely everywhere. Even at the very beginning, the beginning of geometry, geometry is the measurement of the earth. That's what it means. So it means applying numbers to the domain of space already at the very beginning. And this going back and forth between number and space has been going on for complex numbers and you know, at many different times in the history of mathematics. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? There's one there. Oh. There's one down here, and then yeah. we'll be throwing the catch box over ah, here. It's gone already. <laughs> <laughs> Just pick it up and keep throwing it. It won't be harm. Oh, it's uh, going up here. Hold your hands up again. Thank you. <laughs> it's a very tough microphone, so. You have a good insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find oh. it? OK, yes. Oh, um, have you heard about uh, relational frame theory? I'm not it's sure. Relational Which? frame theory. T tell me. Uh, it's um, a more abstract view of languages uh, developed by some psychologists. It, it, uh, it, I think it tried to e equate uh, language and more abstract sk skills into one unit. Hmm. Um, I, I wonder how it fit into your, your view of this, but hmm. if you haven't heard of it, I don't know. Well, I, I don't know the theory, the particular theory, but I, I do want to say something. I went very fast. I think there might be some common features to these different languages. And that would also include the language of music, which in fact has several uh, structures behind it, structures of rhythm, structures of melody and harmony. Um, all of these languages seem to appeal to maybe some basic common structures, binary structures that allow to create nested trees. The notion of a tree structure is common to all of these languages. And that was, I think, Chomsky's main contribution to say, you know, we need a specific type of structure. It's not just a temporal sequence. It's not conditioning. It's not what Skinner was saying. It's a higher level structure of binary trees. Now, that is true for language, uh, natural language. I think it's true also for mathematics and music. And this may be what has changed. 
So we have a rather precise hypothesis about the sort of novel data structure that may be present in humans and perhaps not in uh, other primates. This is a hypothesis that was put forward by Mark Hauser, Tecumseh Fitch, Noam Chomsky, and I think it's a very important foundational paper for us because it gives us some things to track in the brain. That's what we're trying to do now. We had somebody over here. Uh, we, we need a microphone for you, just a second. But <laughs> then I know that we're opting for the right person. Will you, be, will you please throw it in this direction? And we'll help passing it on. There you go. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know we were running out of time. So maybe and uh, hold it up uh, okay. close to your uh, chin. Is there still time, or we're running out of time? Maybe for some, uh, some people need to go away for school. Uh, yes, stuff. but so we are we are wrapping up at twelve thirty, okay. so we have okay. another five okay. minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I was intrigued by what something you said in the beginning, that the, the sense of space, time, and number is something that was evolved before language. And um, maybe this is not the question, but uh, I know that children that uh, are in a way forced to completely uh, give up their first language, for example, in international adoptions, where you're taken completely out of your first language environment and com not, not being able to keep any of that. You have to get yourself a new language. Uh, these children often have problems with just, w with exactly space, time, and numbers. Hmm. So I don't know if you have any comment on that, or is, is it that they need so much uh, brain well, capacity to work with language that they have to push this back? Or? Well, I don't know what such studies actually that would show that adoption children have special problems with mathematics. Um, not not I only think mathematics, but space and numbers and, and, and time and, and um, really? yeah, yeah. I would have to see the studies. I don't okay. know this, but uh, in general, uh, of course, if uh, ado the case of adoptees is extremely interesting because they start with the first language, and then, as you say, they have to sort of forget it, get to a completely different language. Uh, so, I, I, first of all, I would understand that this creates problem at school, right? They typically arrive in the new country at the age of I don't know anything between three and nine. Uh, that would be very difficult to have to relearn a new language at that time period, not to mention also additional emotional difficulties and so on. But I want to say we studied, uh, we have a published paper actually on the language representation in people who were adopted like this. It's a very interesting study. We took some people uh, who were adopted from Korea into France and mostly in Brittany, in France, when there are no Korean speakers whatsoever, you know? So basically, they were taken from their country, they had no uh, parents there, and uh, they had to learn French, and they simply did not use Korean anymore. And what, was, what we found, we scanned them when they were young adults, like 18 or 20, and we found that they were, their networks were essentially just like the networks of a French person native French person. They had very strong activations to French. All of the language networks that I showed today were strongly activated by French. And when we, listen, we had them listen to Korean, there was essentially no activation stronger than to any other unknown language, like Japanese, for instance. So it seemed that their brain had completely relearned the new language. Now, there is newer data that suggests they will relearn faster Korean. So there is a sort of dormant trace, but it's very low and barely detectable with imaging. So the evidence is that the language networks during the first few years of life, they are plastic. And they, have, they can very quickly adapt. First of all, they very quickly converge onto the mother language. Maybe in the first year of life already, we have evidence from young children that the language network is already converging. But then it can still revert, probably um, maybe all the way until nine or 10. And then at puberty, it really freezes dramatically. And then it becomes really your frozen first language. Um, so it's a very interesting system, and this is different from mathematics. Mathematics you can learn later, it's more plastic, and it's perhaps losing its plasticity also across time, but not in the same dramatic manner as the language network. So again, it's a difference between them, I think. Do we have any final question? Yes, we have one up here. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you better say wake. Yes. Stanislas, you've presented very convincing evidence of distinctive anatomical regions of the brain that are involved in mathematics. But if you were to take it from that level to the single cell level or to networks, 
do you have any insights yet into what forms of networks can actually do mm. a squared minus b squared and do you have models of that kind of process so that you can go beyond anatomical identification mm. to actually seeing how these networks operate that's a wonderful yeah. question. I, I, we and don't I'll have to ask you for a very brief answer, I'm <laughs> I'll sorry. I'll be super <laughs> brief. We, we have no evidence whatsoever how neural networks could do syntax. The, there is the beginning now of some uh, emergence of artificial intelligence that networks that do recursion. Um, it's, they seem to do it. Uh, there is, for instance, Google Translate is able to handle you know, relative sentences, but nobody knows exactly how these networks do it. They are opaque to analysis. So the same problem we have is the brain. We are endeavoring to get uh, single cell data, but we have no such data in the human syntax areas for the moment. So it's for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stanislas Doan.